Uh, look, we here at Music New South Wales have collected eight of Australia's brightest and most experienced professionals to talk to you about music law, copyright and artist representation. We have Julia Kosky, who's a solicitor at Brett Oaten Solicitors. I might ask people to step up as I call them if possible. This is Jules, uh, and uh, she's one of Sydney's top legal representatives. Julia has a history as a band manager and is also married to Sydney producer and musician to Tony Buchan, so she has a uniquely personal insight into what it's like representing musicians. Uh, we also have Jennifer Arnup from our partners at the Arts Law Centre, wherever she is, there she is. Uh, and that centre provides information and advice free of charge and has partnered with Music New South Wales to present this cinema NASA, which is kind of great to have them here. Thanks for coming. Uh, Tim Levinson, or Earthboy, who's stepping up now, uh, has a uniquely broad perspective on these issues. <coughs> he's an artist in and of himself, he's been a member of The Herd, he runs Elephant Tracks as a label boss, and he's also Hermitude's manager. And at some point when I was a music journalist, sometimes we'd have online fights. It was really good. Uh, Katie Whiten and Martin Cubby are representatives for the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance. They're stepping up together now. Uh, it's a relatively new representative body who are committed to protecting the rights of musicians and artists in Sydney and externally. Ben Fletcher of Money, Penny Business and Taxation Services is our financial expert for the evening and possibly the sharpest dressed <laughs> member of the men. <coughs> uh, he also sits on Music New South Wales board. So if you want to ask him questions regarding law and money, he's your guy. Uh, Solicitor Jonathan Carter has been as highly decorated as he has been variously employed. Here he is, shaking Jules Munro's hand in a kind of display of old school mateship. He's held key positions in the Australian Federal Court, has worked as a legal and business manager at Sony and as the Vice President of Legal and Business Affairs at EMI. And now he works as General Counsel and Company Secretary at APRA. Uh, so he will represent your rights as an artist, or at least pretend to care about them. Our chair for the evening is Jules Munro, lastly, a music-oriented solicitor with over 15 years of experience. He's authored books on the subject, such as Music Business, A Musician's Guide to the Australian Music Industry, and works for high-profile artists and film companies, and is uniquely placed to chair and moderate tonight's discussion, which he'll be doing from there. <clears throat> My name's Jake Stone. Uh, I'm a songwriter and singer for Blue Juice and I also work at Music New South Wales as the education officer organising panels like this, which is my first one, so thanks for coming. Um, <laughs> cheers. Uh, music New South Wales is the peak body for contemporary music industry stuff. We're invested in ensuring the creative and financial sustainability of the industry and we host workshops like this once a month uh, on a variety of topics to ensure that emerging professionals will have access to the best information from their peers while they navigate their careers. We also offer resources like post-job ads and deal to our members like Virgin and Qantas baggage options we, we, we've just helped create. Um, we put out a monthly newsletter which I re recommend you sign up for just over there at the desk with Kirsty or Caitlin. We'll have some resources on hand like legal packs, arts law and APRA information sheets and next week on our resources page there'll be an updated tax pack for musicians. So thanks to our friends at Moneypenny for that. Just before we uh, start, I'd also like to thank Carrie Furlow at Sydney TAFE and the trainee chefs and hospitality workers from The Apprentice who keep giving us drinks for free. Um, and I'd like to thank our partners at the Arts Law Centre of Australia, the Australia Council for the Arts, APRA and Sydney TAFE Music. Without any further ado, let's hand over to Jules to start the show. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to Music New South Wales for putting this evening on. Thank you to all these people who have come in and given up their uh, Tuesday evening for us. Um, we have got such a massive list of topics we want to cover tonight. Uh, we have about 90 minutes, I think, to do it in. So we are going to go hard and fast through all the boring but important things you need to know, except we'll try to make them um, less boring and we'll try to make sure that you understand how important they are. I've got a range of um, lawyers, musicians, accountants, advocates, all sorts of skills here on the, on the board. We're going to cover a lot of ground as I said. I've also brought along a copy of my book music business. We're going to give one of these away at the end. We're going to have a quiz, an elimination quiz. So listen carefully and if you remember all the things we said you might just get a large piece of paper from me. Um, the first thing I want to quickly go through is a bit of background 
um, where how I came to be sitting in this chair, really. I s started life trying to make a living as a musician, but I wasn't good enough, so I had to go and be a lawyer. But I always was fascinated by the intersection of creative endeavour and commerce, because it seemed to me it would be a wonderful way to make a living, and it certainly contributed to society. And so I followed that line all the way through my career. And uh, I think many people along this row will have had similar convictions, whether they went into professions and so on, and learned about tax and accounting and advocacy and so on, and um, collecting societies, we'll talk about them, uh, but always had this fundamental um, love of music as a creative, creative form and a, means, a very important means of expression. So in this room today, because we want to make sure we're pitching it to the people in the room, who among you here are musicians? Less than half the people in the room. Who among you are law students? Who among you are doing arts administration or entertainment business courses? So there's this massive uh, group of people who are in indeterminate <laughs> categories. I hope you find this interesting. I was the three, how many here are alcoholics? Well, I asked how many are lawyers. Well, I said law students, didn't I? Who are lawyers, practicing lawyers? What are you doing here? You know all this stuff. Crikey. Anyway, it'll be fun, and we might get some thorny questions from you. The format's going to be this. I'm going to whiz through the bullet points that uh, accompanied the, the bump for that came with the course. Uh, sorry, the advertising for tonight. Um, I'll do a little top liner. I'll go to s the appropriate person here ask a question. Um, at the end of each segment we'll take say three questions in a, in a clump then deal with them then move on to the next one because I want, really want to get uh, get across um, as much as we can tonight. Um, there are no dumb questions. Uh, do put your hand up if you don't understand anything or you wish something to be amplified or repeated. So the first thing on our list was, he said looking at his list, Business structures, because it is a music business after all. Um, we'll get on to the, the world of copyright law and the fundamentals of how you actually even make money from um, your creativity, but the first thing you run into when you wish to make a living or, or any income from this activity is what kind of business structure you're in. So I'll quickly go through the top line on this to save Julia the bother. The, Fundamentally, you can trade as a sole trader and go out and do your, your money and get an ABN and send your invoice. Or you can work with other people in a partnership. Or you can incorporate as a company. They all have different, um, different advantages and disadvantages. Ultimately, if you're starting out very small and it's just you, sole trader structure might be okay. But if you get a very, very big business, the large turnover, as Ben will go into later, sometimes you need to work out how to not be earning quite that much money or how to use your money better. If you're doing something that's inherently risky or you need to split the proceeds with a lot of other people, um, you might go into an incorporated company. So there's a, a legal personality that is actually out there doing the business and none of you are personally liable for the debts of the company. We'll go into that too. And then there's a partnership which a lot of people just are by virtue of joining a band and going on the road. You don't even know you're in a partnership but if you get together with one or more other person to do something with a view to making money, you are in a partnership. There's a whole lot of laws that just apply to you that you wouldn't even know about which affects how you get out of that relationship. That's super, super fast. But can I ask, uh, Julia, you advise a lot of bands, and when they start out, they often have no formal structure at all. And they come to you and they say, what are we meant to do? How do you start that conversation with them? Hello? Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, the first question is, as you've already alluded to, you know, are you working alone or are you working with others? If it's a band, um, I would probably start, you know, depending on, and Ben will talk about this more as far as how much money they're earning, but, um, you know, from a kind of legal structures point of view, it will usually be, um, make more sense for a band to start as a partnership. Just, um, sorry, is it feeding back a lot? Um, so, 
you know, generally, yeah, starting as a partnership probably makes a lot of sense for bands just starting out for simplicity, uh, you know, to, to decrease kind of the admin of, of what you're doing, which can be extensive and can get in the way of creativity. Um, <clears throat> but obviously, as a lawyer, I would be uh, likely to advise that there was some kind of partnership agreement. As Jules said, you know, in the absence of an agreement, there's the, the legislation that governs partnerships that would would say certain things about how you relate to each other and what happens if your business ends. Um, but as a starting point, you know, working as a partnership, having a band agreement that talks about your respective rights and obligations um, would, would probably be the starting point. What are some of the scary, risky things you have to watch out for if you're in a partnership as opposed to some other structure? Oh, you mean joint and several liability? Um, yeah, so obviously, as it, so in a partnership, you, oh, that's the other thing I would say straight away to a client is a lot of these issues are, are also accounting related. And, um, you know, it's not my job to give any advice about people's kind of accounting or tax, um, <coughs> tax obligations, and they'd need to speak to someone about that. Um, but as in a partnership, <coughs> you are, it's called joint, you're jointly and severally liable, which means that you are t collectively liable for any debts or um, debts that you may have, or and you're also uh, share obligations, <coughs> which means that uh, if someone, I'm just trying to think of an example. You can give well, an example. The, 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 in my draft tagline, which Jake bravely used, it was, uh, we want your van, not your debts. So any one partner would have to pay the debts of the entire partnership. So if somebody went down to um, hire, a, hire a PA or a whole backline and then just stole it, everyone would be on the hook to pay the hire shop out, not just the person who did the wrong thing. So um, there's nothing you can do about that. That's what the law says. All you can do is arrange between yourselves that you'll protect each other as a matter of contract. Thanks, Julia. How, how are partnerships taxed, Ben? I mean, wherever the money goes, the tax follows like a loyal dog. So how do partners, well, are there any tax advantages to a partnership structure, assuming you've dealt with all the liability issues in the legal side? Not really. A partnership sort of works as a bucket. All the money that the partnership earns, the touring income, all the rest of it goes in. The expenses come out and the net bottom line gets split uh, either equally or if they've got a band agreement that says otherwise, uh, based on the band agreement. Um, if it's a loss, it distributes a loss. If it's income, it d distributes that income. So you, the, the, the income's taxed in your own hands personally. It's not in the business, is it? Yeah, the partnership's just a, it's a legal agreement. It's, uh, it's a entity that needs to lodge a tax return, but it's not a taxing entity in itself. It, it does not pay, it doesn't pay tax. So you can see that partnerships are simple to get into and sort of innately um, attractive. Well, they just happen because you get together and you start playing gigs. But there's actually quite a lot of difficulty attached to them because you can be liable if everyone else has debts, there's no tax advantage, everything's, you know, it, it's a difficult thing. It takes just as much admin as any other structure in many ways, which is why a lot of people decide if they've got enough um, income to justify some of the admin to incorporate the, the, the business of the band within a little private company. Um, so, at the risk of um, hammering you on this this sort of stuff, Julia, what what are the what are the main aspects of a, a company organisation when you're talking to say a four piece band? What what do you say to them when they're considering incorporating? I guess so. Th the first thing that you should know about a company that it's a separate legal entity, which means that you know that for the purpose of law and and for contracting, the company is separate from the individuals that may be shareholders of that of that company. So um, if there's any obligations or liabilities, then it's the company that's, ob that's obliged to do certain things or is liable for any debts or other liabilities. Um, and so essentially the agreement that you may enter into as a band um, between the members would be quite similar if you were a, if it was a partnership agreement or a shareholders agreement, which is the kind of agreement you'd enter into if you were setting up a company. There's some process, you know, setting up a company is actually very simple. You can buy, you just buy a, a shelf company, you decide, you give it your name, and you lodge some forms with <coughs> with ASIC, which is the 
which is, sorry, this is really freaking me out. I'm clearly not a musician. Can we just turn it, maybe turn the PA down a little bit. <clears throat> Yeah, it's all right. We're trading as a company, so you can't sue us personally. Um, <laughs> heading, heading, heading up to the high level on this, the reasons companies were invented was so that people could isolate risk and take risky ventures on to see if they could make a go of it without putting the house in as collateral. So the whole concept is shifting risk away from you personally, so you can give it your best shot. There are rules about what you can and can't do, and away you go, and if it all goes to hell and you lose your, lose your money and the business doesn't succeed, then hopefully that's it. There's no comeback. Of course, sophisticated ways of getting people on the hook have evolved, but that's, that's the fundamental concept. Um, which is why, as between shareholders, you do need to look at your own internal relations. There's things to consider, such as, can I be involved in other bands while I'm in this? Um, can I sell my shares to other people, whoever I care? Um, when I leave, can I compete? There's, there's a long list of complex matters you need to turn your mind to if you want to get into a company uh, in a way that will save a lot of heartache down the track. Because the best time to regulate your relationships between yourselves as shareholders is to do that when you're all in love and it's going to be exciting and you're keen. Um, I regularly in my commercial law practice have to deal with businesses, some of them quite big, that break down, not because they're not profitable, not because they're not fantastic, not because they don't employ lots of people and have cool people working with them, but because the shareholders can't decide anything and they're in a dispute. And if you don't have a contract governing how that stuff is dealt with, you can get into a dreadful stalemate, because it's all about votes. So a 50-50 deal, 50-50 shares, same... If we had, if John and I had the same number, no one can win a vote, and so really good businesses and really good endeavours can be stymied by a failure to plan early, and you can never sort it out a, a mutually, um, a mutually pleasing or at least mutually annoying uh, resolution, arguing from a position where you're not obliged to. So people just don't do it. You really need to take some time to think about. What are we going to do when this happens? What are we going to do when this happens? And, and regulate your um, regulate your relationship. There's there's information about that in in the book. There's also lots of information online about that. But and it's something that you know you would if you are thinking of going into incorporating with 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 band members, you have to come and really recommend that you come and see someone like Julia, Julia or myself because the cheapest money you'll ever spend on lawyers and this stuff is when you're setting it up properly because. But the price of a shareholders agreement, that's, that's two stroppy letters, probably, <laughs> once you're fighting. So it's, it's something to bear in mind. Did you have anything, to, uh, can you give people a quick uh, view, Ben, on how companies are taxed? Yeah, um, as you've said, that a company is a separate legal entity. Unlike the partnership where all the money comes in and goes out and is taxed at an individual level, a company is a really great basic unit for a musician to trade through. Um, it, gives you a bit of legal protection, um, which the lawyers I'm sure will talk about. As far as tax goes though, a company pays tax at 30 cents in the dollar, whether it earns one dollar or a billion dollars, it doesn't make any difference. Whereas an individual, um, which is how you're taxed if you're in a partnership, goes from 0% through to 49%. So there's a 19% difference there, which if you're earning quite a bit of money, can actually you know, be quite significant. Um, any tax that is paid by the company at 30 cents can eventually be repatriated back to the shareholders uh, via a franking credit uh, when dividends are paid out, which, not to go into it, but it kind of works in the same way that your wages work. If you had tax withheld on your wages, that's money that you have to pay tax on, but you get a credit for it. And company tax works in the same way when it comes back out to the, to the shareholders. That is the most succinct and clear way I've ever heard that explained. Thank you, Ben. It's the three beers. <laughs> you should have three beers before you start at work every morning. Oh, I, <laughs> um, I think that really brackets. Oh, there's one other business structure which is just being a sole trader, and that means everything's on the line. Everything you own is on the line. If it goes wrong, that stuff is all available to your creditors. Uh, it's simple and easy, but it's also high risk. Um, as soon as you start earning a significant amount of cash or going out and doing risky things, think about not being a sole trader. There one, one thing, we get a, I, get a, I don't know if Jules does in his fancy office uh, down at the Bay, but we get a lot of really small bands that might only be turning over 10 grand uh, or less um, coming through the office for looking for advice. 
The basic advice I would give as far as structuring goes, if you're not earning much money, if it's one of you, you're a sole trader. If it's a bunch of you, you're a partnership. If you're starting to earn a bit of scratch and you're involving a lot of contractors and you're, tra you're touring a bit, you set up a company. I think that's probably the easiest way of looking at it um, without having to worry about all that everyone else has spoken about. That's the, the simplest way of looking at it. Yeah, again, Claire. Um, yeah, it, it's one other thing I need to um, raise about companies is companies have a life of their own because they're a separate entity. So companies can handle people leaving and joining. So you can have a business that some shareholder might go and some might come in and it doesn't disrupt the business. I mean, there might be a brand, if it's a company for, for a band, there may be creative or marketing issues associated with lineup changes, but the essential business doesn't have to fall apart. So that is um, something to bear in mind. That's the sort of the first heavy, boring but important um, <laughs> part of the evening. Let's take a couple of questions if there are any about business structuring so that we can then move on to the fascinating and lucrative world of copyright. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It can be so basic that it only addresses the two big scary things, which is um, I promise that I won't incur debts in your name and if I do, I'll indemnify you for, you, for your, what you had to pay for me. It could be that simple. It should certainly say how long you're going to do it for. Now that's a bit of a legal um, technicality because if a partnership doesn't have a defined time period by agreement, it's, it can just be pulled apart just because someone wants to do that. It's called a partnership at will. So you can agree, we'll go for a year and then month to month. That'll satisfy, that'll stop someone just going, I'm out and triggering um, quite heavy duties on you to account and pulling all the assets and liquidate the business. So it can be, I, I could, you could have a partnership agreement that just dealt with those two things or you could have massive ones that are just as complicated as shareholder agreements. Mining ventures have partnership agreements that thick. Um, it really depends on how much risk you want to deal with. Are there any other questions? Our friends at Arts Law may have a partnership checklist or a partnership agreement for bands. Tell us about that, Jennifer. Um, just talk loudly. Um, we've on. got two partnership agreements. One's a letter, it's quite informal. So like this person said over here, if you're looking for something when you're starting out. The other kind we have is a much longer deed which sort of anticipates all the different sort of sorts of issues that you'd want to look at when you're in a band. So you sort of got two options there. The templates are quite sort of standard, I suppose, because everyone's situation is quite different. So you can go through that template and sort of amend it to suit your situation. Um, they do come at a cost, so they're reduced if you're a subscriber to Arts Law, um, but otherwise I think they're around the $55 sort of mark, which is quite good. That's amazing because the people who drafted those agreements are highly, highly skilled lawyers who did it for the love of the Arts Law Centre, which if you are a musician and are not a member, you need to join straight away. It was established by Shane Simpson who hired me and set up Simpsons and they do an incredible job and they give you free legal advice, they've got resources like that and so you should definitely talk to, talk to Jennifer at the end if you want to um, see what they can do to help you and they've got an amazing website with all those resources right there for that very, very cheap price. Any other, one last question. Yeah, that's the cool thing. You can be the shareholder and director of your own company and then run the business, business and put all the risk in that little company and I've got plenty of clients who are. Great question, but there's no hard and fast rule. It just exists until one of the people says it doesn't, unless you've agreed to a time period. So there's another reason to make it for a defined period of time because then at least you're not going to have obligations to your old bandmate from 10 years ago when the, um, you know, Quentin Tarantino comes knocking wants to put the song in a movie. Um, one more. 
Um, just a quick question. What's the difference between a shareholder and a director? Go, Julia. Um, okay, so a shareholder is one of the owners of the company, and um, and the way a company is owned is divided by shares, um, and shareholders have certain rights in relation to the company. A director is part of the like governing body of a company and is appointed by a shareholder, usually in the constitution, by virtue of the constitution or the shareholders agreement. Simple enough, I hope. Does that answer your question? You can be both. All right, let's move on to ever more interesting areas where we're going to get some more war stories and uh, we're getting to the real nitty gritty here legally, apart from structuring. Structuring is important, but copyright's more important. And that's why we have Jonathan Carter here from Apple.